don't block the, the path of inquiry. Don't lay down rules that make it impossible for people to ask important questions. Welcome to the Thought Stretchers podcast, where we hope to stretch your thinking about important issues in education through rich inquiry. My name is Drew Perkins, and I'm your host for these heterodox conversations for complexity. Hello again, and thanks so much for tuning in. I wanted to share a couple housekeeping notes. One is just a clarification that we have two websites now, one which is our normal professional development site, wegrowteachers.com, and there you can find all of our workshops and services, as well as some other information, including our blogs and this podcast. We also now have our Thought Stretchers education community, which you can find at thoughtstretchers.org. Speaking of that community, we have scheduled a number of events and we'll have more upcoming. One of those is the guest on today's podcast, Ron Richhart. We'll have a book club author visit, which is scheduled for March 13th. And if you go to thoughtstretchers.org, you can sign up and join the community, join that book club and RSVP there. We also have some other events there, including a salon discussion and some roundtable discussions and some other things coming up as well. So again, you can find that by going to thoughtstretchers.org. Or if you go to wegrowteachers.com, you'll see a tab on the menu up on the top called Join Our Community. And there you can see the events and a link to join the community. On that menu also, you'll see PBL Grow 24, which is tentatively scheduled for June 24th through 27th here in our hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. You can pre-register for that now, which means you'll have first dibs at registration because this event is limited to 40 seats. Again, you can find that at wegrowteachers.com along the top menu or going to wegrowteachers.com forward slash grow 24. As always, please reach out to me with any comments, questions, and concerns. My email address is drew at thoughtstretchers.org. In this episode, I spoke with Ron Richhart, who is a researcher and author with Harvard Project Zero. He's retired now, but he has a new book called Cultures of Thinking in Action, 10 Mindsets to Transform Our Teaching and Students' Learning. Ron was on the podcast last in May of 2020. That was when we were still Teach Thought before we changed our name to Thought Stretchers Education. That is episode 209, and you can find that by going to our website, which is wegrowteachers.com, and looking for the Teach Thought podcast archives. We started our conversation by talking about some of the connections between learning and thinking, and then I asked him to unpack some of his thoughts because he writes about it a fair amount in the book about the distinctions between the direct and explicit instruction and more traditional kinds of approaches and a more inquiry and constructivist education approach of which he advocates for, and of course we do as well. One of the things that he mentions in the book and we talk about is the difference between informational learning and transformational learning. And as I asked him about mindset number eight, which relates to the idea of questioning, which of course resonates with our work heavily, I asked him to make some of the connections between the types of questions and the ways in which those kinds of learning approaches might show up and map out to each other. One of the themes that came through in that part of the conversation was the sense of curiosity and developing that with our teachers and in our students. I always appreciate the chance to talk with Ron and take a look at his work. We use a lot of it in our work and our workshops. And as usual, I hope you find this conversation with Ron helpful. All right, I'm here with Ron Richhart. Happy to have him back on the podcast. I don't know when it was last you were on. Probably something to do with your previous book, but it's always great to uh, to take in your work. And we're going to talk about your new book, which is Cultures of Thinking in Action, 10 Mindsets to Transform Our Teaching and Students' Learning. But before we do, I want to give you the opportunity to, uh, again, say hello and uh, give anybody who is not familiar with your work uh, a bit of a refresher of who you are. Yeah, well, great to be with you again, um, Drew. So um, I was a researcher at um, Harvard Project Zero for some 27 years. I just recently retired from there, although I continue to teach some um, online courses for them um, and still kind of be involved. And even though I have retired from Harvard, I continue um, to write and do my, my research around building cultures of thinking. So continue to work with schools all over the world and trying to advance the idea of 
um, making classrooms really places where students thinking is valued, where it's visible, where it's actively promoted. Gotcha. Yeah, you, uh, as we were talking before you, we started recording, you are now retired. So I was wondering, what, what title does he use now? I guess so still officially a researcher, right? Yeah, that's... <laughs> okay. Well, uh, since we are here to talk about your book and you know, related matters, I'll just start with the general question. What's your book about? <laughs> um, so, I mean, for, you know, over 20 years, I've been kind of um, researching, developing this idea of a culture of thinking. The early work that I did really identified the, the mechanisms of culture um, that, that kind of levers the building blocks there, what I call the, the cultural forces. What this new book is about is really thinking about, um, you know, having worked with these ideas for so long, seeing where people make progress, seeing where people um, sometimes fail to really kind of sustain their efforts or go very deeply. Um, began to kind of recognize there are certain mindsets that um, the teachers who are very accessible at building a culture of thinking that they hold. And so I wanted to kind of uncover those, articulate those, really be explicit about those mindsets as foundational elements for building a, a culture of thinking. And so this kind of came out of the um, most kind of recent um, research that I've um, been doing and um, again, drawing on um, examples from the various schools that I work with around the world. All right. Yeah, so you've got 10 mindsets, and I, I suppose maybe it may be helpful to, I guess, operationalize. What do you mean by mindset? And then maybe we can get into some of the specifics of some of those mindsets. Yeah, um, well, kind of backing up just a, a little bit there, one of the ways that I often kind of talk about why mindsets matter and why they are important is that a lot of times in education, we focus on tools. We focus on the new stuff, the new practices, um, and we get tools in people's hands, you know, um, visible thinking routines, something else. Of course, we all kind of like tools, um, but tools alone are not enough to really kind of transform classrooms or um, transform schools. That in addition to those tools, people have to develop the skill set for really um, being able to work with those tools effectively, which is an ongoing process. But then what sits behind that is a set of, of mindsets, and the mindsets are the beliefs, um, the values that people hold. And when I talk about beliefs, they're um, what's fundamental here in a culture of thinking. They are beliefs about um, learning. They are beliefs about teaching. They are beliefs about um, the, the purpose and goals of school. And so when you have those beliefs, those just kind of motivate actions. And, and one of them that, you know, has always been kind of really kind of striking, again, thinking about the the tools, um, you know, tools that I and my colleagues have developed around visible thinking, the visible thinking routines. Um, again, we get those in, in people's hands is the mindset of that learning is a consequence of thinking. So if you don't believe that learning is a consequence of thinking, then first of all, when you're presented with this tools, you begin to kind of think about, well, why? Why should I even, you know, use these? And some people, because they're at a school where they're doing that, then kind of on a very token level, uh, may try a few routines. They may say, ah, you know, worked, didn't. They may use them as a way of kind of jazzing up a lesson, um, engaging students a little bit more. Um, that can work. But where we really see progress is when teachers really have this belief, well, learning is a consequence of thinking. So yes, I've got content, but I look at this content and say, well, what's the thinking I need students to do around this content to help them build understanding? And then they see the thinking routines as just being a tool for accomplishing that. But it's the mindset that is the driver. And so when I talk about mindsets, think about, well, what is it that drives our action in the classroom? And that when we have that, then those tools begin to kind of it automatically points to certain um, tools that we might want to do. Um, it points in a direction. It, it points our focus and attention um, about the kinds of things we pay attention to in the classroom. 
So again, if you believe that learning is a consequence of thinking, you begin to pay attention to the thinking your students are doing and how that's helping them to build understanding. But if you're focused in, well, learning is just you know doing what I say. I just show you stuff and you repeat it and you, you do that, then that's what teachers pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Are students able to just faithfully execute what I've just shown them? And then they think, well, they're not paying attention or, oh, I'll explain it a different way. So their whole kind of um, modus of operating in the classroom is based on those mindsets, those beliefs and values. Yeah, and, you know, the, the way that you make that connection between, you know, learning and thinking reminds me, I'm sure you've probably heard of it, Daniel Willingham's phrase, I think it's uh, memory is the residue of thinking. And so it, it actually maybe is, a, is an interesting sort of brook between some of the things that you dive into here in this book and some of the things I've been really trying to, I guess, explore and 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 figure out some some better paths forward. I'm genuinely trying to not have, you know, like this camp versus that camp, direct instruction, explicit instruction versus inquiry and progressive and those kinds of things. But of course, that's the world in which we live. And uh, I think Daniel Willingham actually makes a good good bridge between those two. And, you know, one of the things that I'm recognizing or remembering here, and I highlighted in this book of yours, is that knowledge and skills are important, but the bigger question is whether students can apply their learning to new situations. I just actually, before I read this, did a blog post of, on our site, you know, like knowledge is necessary but not sufficient. And of course, the, the ways in which we, like the educational outcomes and what we're really looking for from students and for, for them to do, as you mentioned, I think is, is often in that sort of more traditional mindset feels like, a, and I don't want to straw man, I don't want to mischaracterize, but feels like it's, you know, somewhat surface, somewhat limited. You know, the way that John Hattie would talk about it, surface deep and transfer. Uh, I don't think you used that that sort of framework here. It, so maybe I'm, I'm, the question is like, when you think about the the sort of knowledge, surface deep and transfer learning, those kinds of things, what framework works well for you and how do you use, what's the language you, that you use to sort of describe the, the spectrum of what we want students to engage in, especially with regards to knowledge? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, one of the things that has been really kind of influential on me as, as a, a researcher, um, when I first went to Harvard, one of the, the first research projects that I worked on was the Teaching for Understanding project. Um, and, you know, that was almost some 30 years ago. Um, at the time, the, the idea of teaching for understanding was actually kind of relatively new. Um, people were not talking a lot about understanding. The focus was on knowledge. Um, at the time, it was also the, the largest research um, project um, in the country. Um, funded by the Spencer Foundation, because they said, you know, when we look at the research, a lot of our research is about how to teach kind of skills and knowledge. So at Project Zero, we really do focus a lot on this idea of understanding. Now it's, um, you know, people talk about um, deeper learning. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, how to deeper learning transfer. We really don't make a distinction um, when we talk about understanding. For us, when we talked about teaching for understanding, it did mean deeper learning. Mm -hmm. It did mean transfer, that understanding, you know, um, it, you know, that a big difference between knowledge and, and understanding is mm -hmm. we can think about knowledge as being kind of largely possessive. I possess this piece of knowledge, whereas understanding always implies the ability to use and apply and to transfer that and that ability to transfer, um, you know, and also a distinction between just kind of near transfer, something that looks pretty similar to where you've not, and far transfer um, also is reflective on levels of understanding. So understanding is not kind of this one endpoint. Um, understanding, we think, has a lot of depth to it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are degrees of understanding. So um, although I you know, do use the phrase because lots of people use it now talking about deeper learning, mm -hmm. um, for me and for kind of my colleagues at Project Zero, our big frame has always just been understanding. 
Hmm. And of course, you know, understanding connects to knowledge that, um, you know, one way that people even talk about understanding is understanding is connected knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so when knowledge is connected, it is easier to retain, it's easier to recall, it's easier to apply all of those things. So teaching for understanding um, shouldn't be pitted against knowledge acquisition. Right. Um, it's part of that. It just means that we're, you know, not satisfied with mere knowledge acquisition. We're wanting that um, greater degree of use, application, and transfer. Yeah. Well, your your point that deeper learning is now a, a term that, that is heavily in use here. I'm in Kentucky, and we have a big deeper learning initiative, and you know, certainly that is a, a term that is being used widely. And I'm curious how you what you've seen from that, because I, I mean, I'm certainly a fan of deeper learning, uh, but I also, if you know, it strikes me that it can and sometimes and maybe even often fall short of actually getting students to that sort of understanding, right, that it is. Uh, I think f your terms that that I've adopted, and I love the you know sort of the behavioral engagement, and not necessarily the cognitive engagement. And so I'm I'm curious if you have any reflections on what you're seeing out there, sort of the the the, the panoply of of deeper learning, and and what that looks like in our schools. Well, you know, I mean, I think just just some degree. Um, the, the terminology can be useful because, you know, people can make a contrast between surface and, and deeper. They can look at um, their instruction. They can look at their assessments. They can look at their curriculum. They can begin. It's a pretty easy distinction to begin to kind of um, look at. Um, you know, again, based on our, our research on um, teaching for understanding, what we found was, you know, early on, we had to do a lot of work with people around what 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 does understanding entail what does that look like that it's not immediately apparent so i think there is a somewhat you know usefulness in there um you know another colleague at, at harvard um joel meta um who wrote the book in search of deeper learning mm -hmm. um you know i think that he he talks about some really nice things there when he talks about um you know deeper learning that it involves also identity formation that it also involves um creativity that it also involves kind of mastery there um i think those are kind of useful things and i think that when we talked about understanding we were not also uh, we did actually talk about that um creativity in the sense of originality so we did talk about that but we didn't talk about it in terms of identity and that is something that i um the the issue of identity is something that i find myself talking a lot more about in terms of a, a goal of school um, that identity formation that basically you know young people are trying to find their place in the world they're trying on lots of identities um it's our job to kind of keep that open for them keep that flexible help them you know not close doors in terms of that so to see themselves as mathematicians as writers as authors as artists as musicians as geographers all of that um, identity so i think that that actually is a really you know useful part of, of um, john meta and sarah fine's um, definition there um, that i like about that well one of the things you mentioned was transfer and i think you're talking about it in the context of knowledge and understanding and i'm wondering if you extend that to i guess skills you know one of the pushbacks against more progressive education is this research and evidence that says that l lots of skills and sort of critical thinking kinds of things tend to not transfer well between domains, although just I think this morning I saw a paper that essentially pushed back on that and, and showed some, some evidence that that's ne not necessarily true. And I think about certainly there are some domain-specific kinds of processes, you know, thinking like a mathematician, thinking like a scientist or an engineer or whatever, but that there are, to use your term, sort of a mindset, right? Some things that we might sort of generalize uh, generalize and in a sort of transfer of like our, our one of my big things and you know a whole whole mindset on it of questions and and the, the role of inquiry so i want to develop at least my daughters and students that i that i've worked with and the teachers that i work with to develop that inquiry skill because to me that is generalizable as a problem solving 
tool. And so I'm curious how you think about that that sense of transfer and the limitations and and maybe even some things that your your work and your routines that you've you've developed maybe help sort of bridge some of those those domain gaps. Yeah. Um you know, I mean, again, transfer being being a, a big goal there that we, you know, one of the important things about transfer is that we just should not automatically expect it. We should not just think that it's it's going to happen, that we really have to attend to the issue um, of transfer. Um, again, my colleague David Perkins um, and Gabrielle Solomon, you know, did some research on transfer and they kind of identified that we can develop transfer by um, kind of two big instructional techniques from the idea of um, what they called hugging, which is keeping the learning close. So problem-based instruction, project-based instruction. So we're learning skills in a context, which helps us see how the skills are useful. then we also have to attend to bridging and bridging is thinking about well where else where else might this look and of course um, that's far transfer and that's a little bit more challenging but we shouldn't just expect that um, to happen so some skills um, you know there are a lot of things that are very um, you know again domain um, specific when we talk about thinking in particular a good example of um, a kind of, of thinking that you know isn't all that um you know transferable is reasoning with evidence um so someone can actually be quite good at reasoning with evidence say in literature and then not so good at doing it in science or really good at doing it in history and not so good at doing it in the arts so it tends to be very domain specific so part of that um one of the reasons why is that what counts as evidence is quite different across every um you know discipline there and so you have to learn well what counts as as evidence in um history what counts as evidence in science and really being able to identify that then in contrast something that we have found that is very highly transferable is the idea of of looking closely and observing. So a routine like um, see, think, wonder, which is helping students um, really kind of focus in on what they they notice there, or another routine um, like zoom in that really um, helps you very specifically focus in on parts of an image. Um, What we found is that that actually is pretty transferable when kids get very used to looking at things in detail and closely um, that that carries over into lots of things. So that's by comparison, a a pretty transferable thing. So it it is quite variable in terms of what Mm -hmm. uh, we might find has um, a good transfer rate and what, what doesn't, but at all the times we should never just expect it. Yeah. um, Yeah. Well, one of the things that I was talking with John Hattie about, about, you know, he's got his new book, I guess it's not new now, the, the, visible is it visible learning the sequel i get i get your visibles mixed up sometimes <laughs> you know and it's 2100 or plus meta analyses and that kind of thing but when i was talking with him about his latest book i mentioned one of the things that i think or what what i see what i see as a tendency of of, uh, of of real importance for this more traditional again sort of direct and explicit instruction folks is the matter of efficiency and he 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 said oh I think it's effectiveness and uh, I tend I still see and I see it in the readings that I that I look at from those folks you know that the matter of efficiency and of course one of the ways one of the things that is I think true about the kind of teaching and learning that that you're talking about and that I advocate for is that it's not necessarily efficient in the same, at least not in the same ways, right? I mean, it is, we, we certainly, uh, your routines and the, and the protocols and things are meant to be in some ways efficient, but they're not efficient in the same ways as, you know, Rosenstein's 10 principles in, of instruction. And so it gets, it, it really makes me think there's a very big difference between what they think the purpose of school is. And I know you articulated in the book at one point, maybe articulate how you think about efficiency and and the role of school and and effective teaching and learning. Yeah. um, 
I, I would agree with you that what it comes down to is thinking about um, the, the purpose of school and thinking about when we think about, um, you know, efficiency. Um, I, I would say that that's not necessarily something that, again, is I would kind of agree with Hattie there in terms of thinking about kind of effectiveness rather than efficiency. I think sometimes if we're overly focused on efficiency, we look for the quick fix. Mm -hmm. We look for something with kind of immediate returns. Um, you know, I, I would agree that there are certainly, um, you know, times when direct instruction is needed, but um, I think that um, direct instruction is also um, sometimes overused under the name of efficiency, um, because if what you want is at the end of the class, you want students to be able to um, do the quiz, which you have outlined and get, you know, 90, 80%, mm -hmm. you, going through them and saying, here's what I'm going to quiz you on, here's what we're going to do, here's what it is, and then give them a quiz right away. It looks like efficiency. But, um, and so direct instruction, uh, you know, the, you know, kind of um, weakness of the research on direct instruction is that, that um, many times, not all times, but many times the um, assessment of direct instruction is very, very short term. And so you're looking at effectiveness on a short term scale, but then you follow up you know, a week later, two weeks later, a month later, and you find that a lot of those gains have actually diminished. Mm -hmm. So you could say that, you know, engaging kids, doing inquiry, getting them curious, you could say, well, that doesn't look like efficient because at the end of the class, I don't have students being able to name off these, you know, right. objectives from my list. So this seems very inefficient. But what, um, you know, some studies have shown is that, well, when we look at that over time, what we find is, well, students actually do develop some of those inquiry skills. They are more engaged. They continue to be curious. They continue to like school. And their learning and understanding is there over time. So it stays with them on a longer um, basis. So I think that we can, you know, kind of be confused if we um, think about efficiency as kind of just short-term gains. Um, rather than the long-term game. So when I think about the purpose of school, you know, I, um, you know, one of the, the questions that I always am posing to teachers is the question, um, encourage them to ask themselves, you know, who are my students becoming as thinkers and learners as a result of their time with me? That we want our students to be able to take their place um, in the world. We want them to be powerful thinkers and learners, um, not just with our content. Of course, we've got that as an immediate goal, but we want that to extend, um, you know, beyond um, the classroom. So rather than, you know, having students never wanting to take our course again, um, we would like to encourage that kind of curiosity and interest and that sense of efficacy around our subject rather than being kind of turned off to it. Yeah. Um, so looking at that long range picture, um, which again, it doesn't mean that we're neglecting the short range um, there that we've, of course, got content. That's our vehicle. That's what we're we're looking at um, in the moment. But we can teach that content in a way that also um, encourages that sense of, of student efficacy and agency and also that long term ability as a thinker and learner. Yeah. And, you know, just to clarify, so. Uh, I would agree in, in efficiency to me is seems like a, an odd way to uh, odd metric to, to be really focused on. Obviously efficiency is part, we don't want to be inefficient. We don't want to be sloppy and loose. And, and yeah, certainly John Hattie talks a lot about effectiveness. What I hear from the direct and explicit instruction folks is r a real focus on that efficiency that in lots of the ways that you describe it. One of the other things that, I really think about, and, and you know, certainly lots of variables, but when we think about the sophistication of the teaching methods and moves and practices that one might need to to have to be a really effective teacher and to you know do this kind of uh, cultures of thinking kind of of work, that it you know there's an argument that has been made and is made and you know, resonates with me somewhat is that if we have teachers that are trying to do a more progressive inquiry, constructivist kind of education, and they don't have the skills, 
that they leave out some of the things, the foundational pieces, like a direct explicit instruction, that the students are going to suffer because, and, and we see this with project-based learning. I see examples where, and, and I just heard an interview with Ron Berger, and he was talking about just because it's project-based learning doesn't mean it's good, right? There's some things that we need to have in place that are effective, uh, about effectiveness, and if not, then it can be a real problem. In my estimation, we really owe it to the profession and the kids to do the, do that and do it right. So are there, you mean, does it make some sense, or how do you, I guess, how do you respond when people say, well, not every teacher is ready to do that, can do that, has the skills to do that. So we should at least start them off with, you know, basic kinds of direct and explicit instruction kinds of methods because at least the kids will be getting sort of knowledge and content. So how do you think about that? Um, well, I don't think that our solution to anything should ever be that we kind of dumb down the profession or that we, um, you know, say uh, teachers can't do this, that we look at kind of what teachers need to do. You know, a good example is, um, you know, Finland, um, they have achieved their gains by investing in teachers, by developing um, kind of those, those skills there. So we have to think about, well, what does the ongoing professional learning, you know, kind of look like? Mm -hmm. I, I certainly agree with you that you could take um, anything um, and you could find people not doing it well. Sure, versus people sure. Well. Direct and you know, instruction included. Yeah, I mean, I, I began my, my teaching career in New Zealand, um, and New Zealand was kind of the, um, you know, um, hotbeds, um, origins of whole language. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that got, you know, transported to the U.S., and everyone said, well, this doesn't work. Well, you know, I mean, New Zealand had the highest literacy rates in the world, so obviously it did work. Um, it didn't work when it was transported and it didn't work because people, again, didn't do it well, didn't understand kind of that well. And I think this, again, points to a big problem that we have in education is anything new comes around project based learning, um, you know, inquiry, direct research, and and it's. Um, we think that we just give people, you know, here are the tools, here are the practices, here are the things you do, here's a book, and we expect them to do that. And we neglect to develop both their skill sets and their mindsets around that. So, you know, a, a good example, um, you know, the one of the mindsets here, again, is the idea that learning occurs at the point of challenge. Mm -hmm. And so um, Jeffrey Chopin at University of California in Irvine um, looked at um, how teachers who were learning to kind of deal with, um, you know, challenging um, problems in mathematics and in, in science. And what he found was, well, a big difference um, in the, the teacher effectiveness was the degree to which the teachers were focused on the right answer. And so they were using these materials that involve challenge and they would give students the challenge and the teachers that were focused on, well, do students have it right? Are they getting it? Um, when they saw students struggle, what they did was they jumped in, they simplified the problem, they over scaffolded, over helped them and they got them to the right answer. Um, whereas the more effective teachers looked at students struggling and they paid attention to those students thinking. What's the thinking they're doing in this moment? What skills do they already have? What do they need? And they leveraged what students were doing to help them continue to work with the challenge and to be successful through the challenge. So, you know, that's a good example of, you know, here teachers are just given these materials, you know, told, you know, it's important to kind of challenge kids, but they weren't told, you know, ah, uh, you know, it, it depends. We have to really believe that challenge is good for students. It's not just give them, you know, these materials because they were handed to you. Um, so being afraid of the challenge made teachers want to look for the right solution, um, overly help students. So again, having that mindset is really important that you, uh, you know, are recognizing and, you know, admittedly, there's a lot of finesse in that, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you know, as a teacher, you are walking this line of you don't want students to get so frustrated, they give up, 
you want them to see progress, um, but also you don't want to jump in and rescue students. So you're doing kind of this very fine dance. I think that you are also doing that dance of recognizing in that moment, um, here's some information the student needs but doesn't have and that's where a direct instruction um, could come in that would be very useful but it, it's you know teachers are making a ton of decisions and the more we um, keep telling new teachers and teachers who are already in the profession and society at large um, yeah you know you don't need to make those decisions we'll just give you materials and you just do this mm -hmm. Um, we're never going to improve our schools. We're not going to improve the classrooms. We we simply have to invest in teachers. Yeah, well, and, and that's certainly a part of the problem. And as you, I'm sure you well know, we're not attracting and retaining teachers. Uh, my youngest, or I'm sorry, my oldest, who's uh, 16, thinks she wants to be an elementary teacher. And I was we're looking at colleges and universities and stuff, and I was sort of half joking with her, but sort of not half joking, is that, yeah, I'm not really sure it matters a whole heck of a lot where she goes as far as her ability to get a job. Now, there's obviously some other things that make that decision matter. But then I also said, you know, when she, by the time she is ready to enter the job market, if she is looking for an education job, I'm not 100% sure, sure, sure she'll even need a college education because we're just, we're struggling just to get and keep and retain teachers. So that quality is certainly an issue. The The issue, you know, you're talking about the, the challenge, and I think the, the term that people use who push back is, you know, the productive struggle argument, right? It's like, the idea that kids should should struggle a little bit and of, you know my my retort is of course they should struggle a little bit and i articulate it articulate it similarly to you it's like so we want to want to try to get them right on that sort of sweet spot you know proximal development that kind of thing right so we're we're challenging them but it's not too frustrating where they're shutting down if you would maybe say a little bit more about some of the things and, and tools that you recommend is we want to, to engage them in that challenge or productive struggle, but it has to be a has to be structured or scaffolded or guided or I don't know what what language you would use just to do it and say, guess at the answer and see if you can come up with something is not not what you're recommending. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, there are lots of, of terms that are that people are using that connect into this idea of learning occurs at the um, point of challenge. So that idea of productive struggle, um, you know, key part there is that it's productive that we want, um, you know, students to be able to see that they're making progress. Um, James Nottingham talks about the learning pit, which is the idea that, um, you know, and as we're going into deeper learning, there's a part in which we are in the pit where we're struggling to kind of make sense and pull that out. And then we should kind of recognize that's a natural part of learning, should kind of normalize that, that you can kind of recognize things aren't making sense at this moment. Then you kind of know you're in the pit and then how, what are some things and strategies to kind of move kind of forward um, with that. Um, Robert Bork, who's at UCLA, um and his lab he talks a lot about desirable difficulties um which again i think puts it um in, in contrast to what we were talking about before in terms of efficiency um he says that actually you know um when we just try to be efficient make the brain not work think that ah, i just kind of you know give a good lecture and um therefore you know students learn that actually when students have to ask questions when things get a little bit confusing when things um, aren't clear those desirable difficulties are engaging us more with the content and we need to engage mentally, you know, kind of with um, the content. So um, thinking about that and, you know, creating those things actually builds better memory um, for students um, and better memory strategies when there's a degree of um, actually, okay, I, I um, identifying what we um, don't know, identifying a confusion, identifying um, something that we have forgot, all of those kind of desirable difficulties help us in terms of our, our learning. So all of those, you know, are things that I think that we as teachers can use mm -hmm. um, to help students kind of in that, that moment. But the first thing, you know, I would, 
You know, um, one of the things I, I do with schools um, that I work with, particularly around thinking routines, is we do um, this thing called learning labs. And in a learning lab, we bring a group of teachers together uh, with a host teacher, and the host teacher brings some content, and we plan a lesson using a thinking routine. We plan it together, and then we go in, teach it, and then we talk about that. Well, one of the things I've observed in that is as we're doing the planning, um, teachers will always tend to, you know, I'm speaking in generalities there, but it's very, very phenomenal. They will always want to over scaffold, over structure the task hmm. so that students are successful. Mm -hmm. And always having to pull them, you know, back. Um, you know, someone will say, Well, I don't think students can do that. My reaction is, well, that's good for us to name, but let's see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can't do that. Yes, it's good for us to think about how will we um, intervene, how will we support that, how will we support that struggle, how will we move forward. But our first reaction shouldn't be, I will remove all of that struggle so it doesn't happen. And I think, again, that's because of that kind of efficiency thing that teachers are so used to. Uh, I need to have the lesson be successful by the end of the period. I need to have everyone having, you know, um, an outcome. And so how do I get them to that? Well, I take away that. I over scaffold, give them structure instead of think about, yeah, absolutely important to identify where they might struggle and how we might help them. But you teach the lesson and pay attention to, mm -hmm. ah, you know, um, is everyone struggling? Yeah. <laughs> Are a few students struggling? Is only one student struggle? Is it not a struggle at all? Right. Uh, you know, and I mean, one of the other things when um, when we're doing these learning labs is when the, the teachers go in there and we're observing the lesson, I say, you know, you're absolutely supposed to look at the students, but do not intervene. Because this is an opportunity for you to observe or to see actually many times when a confusion comes up from a student who is working with another student, they will work through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that we, again, tend to intervene too quickly. And this is a chance for us as teachers to actually observe how students actually are able to kind of work through those struggles. So that idea of being aware, identifying where students might struggle, how we might help, but not over scaffolding on the front end. Yeah. Well, I had noticed several places in here references to the work of Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff, and I've had them both on the podcast. And I, I wonder what connections you might make. I, I certainly think that we, you know, Coddling of the American Mind being their, their co-authored book, and I think it relates here in so far as we're we're, we've sort of over scaffolded kids lives we've over structured kids lives we haven't given the opportunities for them to struggle a bit and learn how to do things together as kids and and you know there's some other pieces of that puzzle so I was I was one a little surprised but also uh, happy to see those those uh, references and so I'm curious if you have you know like do you do you make those connections to some of the mental health and anxiety of kids and and how we're developing into adults in in that same sense or or is it just more in the classroom that you're that you're seeing that connection well i mean i, I the, the connection that i i see there is that you know again if connected here to what we've been talking about that learning occurs at the point of challenge when we try to protect students from experiencing failure from experiencing difficulty from having to re regroup that we aren't doing them any big favor right so you know that that connection there that we are that one of again a purpose of education is that we should want to develop you know that resilience um we should want students not to be afraid of challenging um, you know, kind of tasks with that. So we have to really um, embrace that. And I, I see that as a really kind of strong connection with, um, you know, Heitz and Lukanoff's work. Yeah. Well, one of the mindsets that really caught my attention, of course, is number eight, which is questions drive thinking and learning. And, you know, I always talk about our work being through the lens of inquiry. So lots of connections there. And, the typology of question types, I think, is maybe useful for people to to 
I, I guess, better understand. So you've got, uh, I guess, review, procedural, generative, constructive, and facilitative. And so maybe if you don't mind sort of unpacking that for folks, you know, in a way that might help them just think a little bit more deeply about those question types and, and why they're important and how to use them. Sure. Um, so let me begin by talking about where those kind of come from. Um, so several years ago, we were doing a, a very large um, project in the state of Michigan. Um, this was hundreds of teachers um, across uh, multiple school districts, multi-year kind of project um, with these um, teachers. And one of the things we did was we we surveyed the teachers every year and we asked them, you know, as, as a result of working with these ideas, how is your classroom changing? And one of the things that about 70% of, of teachers, and, and this was completely open-ended, so we weren't trying to give them any kinds of prompts at all. Um, about 70% of them mentioned, well, you know, the, the questions I ask are different. Mm -hmm. That kind of raised, well, okay, well, questions are different. And we wanted to know, well, how are they, they different? And we looked at various kind of ways of categorizing questions. And, you know, there's open and closed questions. There are mm -hmm. you know, thick and thin questions, all kinds of, of different ways. There's, you know, Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and we thought about, well, how is it that we can understand this difference in teachers? And we found that, you know, most of these um, other ways of kind of classifying questions didn't really work um, that well for us. Um, one of the first things we noticed was teachers ask a lot of questions. We um, found that teachers were asking anywhere between 50 and 100 questions just in a class period. And what became obvious there was when teachers ask that many questions, um, they certainly don't plan those questions. So mm -hmm. teachers are not sitting down at the beginning of a lesson or even the night before and looking at Bloom's taxonomy and writing 100 questions. They mm -hmm. simply aren't. Mm -hmm. You know, they might use that for a test question or something, but they aren't using in that. So um, then the you know question we ask ourselves, well, if they're asking this many questions, where do they come from? Well, they come from teachers' goals. And so this typology of questions is a goal-directed um, typology. So it looks at, um, we found that teachers tended to have these five different goals. Um, most teachers ask all of these types of questions. So um, one goal is to review material. So they ask review questions. Um, so, you know, they're asking students, do you remember um, who can tell me? Um, and they're wanting to activate knowledge and review. And that's, you know, type of question they ask. Um, we also found, and um, this was something that was a little bit different from our research and looking at some other people who were looking at, at questioning in the um, subject areas, we found, we identified procedural questions. Um, so most procedural questions are questions that have to do with the running of the class. So when we ask our students, you know, do you need more time? Does everyone have their pencil? Um, those are questions which are not content questions. Um, they're just about the running of the class. Most other people who are focused on, say, questioning in mathematics or questioning in science, um, just simply throw out those questions in their data set because they're interested in content. And so when we were concerned with the culture, we said, well, these are still important questions. So and those uh, procedural questions. And even within procedural, um, there are two types of questions. Um, one type of question tends to be pretty ineffective, and that is the question um, that doesn't require an answer. Um, but requires an action. So if a teacher asks, does everybody have their pencil? The teacher actually does not want to hear yes, no, yes, no. Right. They actually want everyone to get out their pencil. And so those types of questions are not very effective because they're actually more difficult for students to process. And they're more difficult in particular for students with any kind of processing challenge, which includes young learners, second language learners, anyone with a learning disability. What's much more effective is just issue a directive. Everyone, please get out your pencil. Now, there are some procedural questions which are actually kind of worth asking. So when I ask as a teacher, you know, do you need more time? I actually want an answer to that. 
And so, and I'm actually going to make a decision about that. So um, two different types of procedural questions. Constructive questions have to do with building understanding as opposed to reviewing material. Um, so where might we use this? How is this going? What do you think this is connected to? Generative questions, um, the rarest type of questions, those would be essential questions, questions of inquiry. These are big questions, and you you simply can't ask a lot of those. Mm -hmm. You ask a big question, and it kind of lingers in the air for a long time. So um, even in mathematics, when you do a, a, a problem-based instruction, you've got one big problem question, and you're dealing with that question over kind of the, the course of the, the lesson. And then finally, the last category were the facilitative questions. And what they facilitate is they facilitate thinking. So these are always follow-up questions. Um, so a student, we've asked a question, a student is given a response, and we follow up with, well, what makes you say that? Can you tell me more about that? Where do you think that idea come from? What are you basing that on? So these are inv invitations to students to elaborate, to explain, to justify, to give evidence for their thinking. So it's actually developing a deeper level of thinking. It's also very, very useful for us as teachers because it's giving us more information mm -hmm. about teachers. So these five question types reflect for kind of five goals that, that teachers have. Yeah. And and the facilitative questioning is, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, something that you advocate for being teachers should be really heavy on those kinds of things. And we use it in our work. And, and you know, what are the versions of what makes you say that that you can come up with? Uh, I think I even published a blog of like you know, <laughs> 20 different ways you could phrase this question. Right. Uh -huh. And it strikes me as one of the distinguishing features between a teacher who I'm going to go back to uh, early in the book, I, I guess it's in mindset one, or maybe it's in the introduction, but you make, I think a really interesting and important distinction between informational learning versus transformational learning. And, you know, there's certainly some mapping on to direct and explicit instruction, more traditional versus, you know, more constructive, that kind of thing. Uh, I would venture to guess that teachers who are using that kind of facilitative questioning and a st inquiry stance, a mindset, you know, you could characterize it a number of different ways, are teachers who, whether they know it or not, are more in the mode of sort of transformational learning, whereas the teachers who use less of those kinds of questions and those other kinds of questions that you that you mentioned, which are important, and we want to think about how we can use them, are much more in the sort of informational learning. Is that does that sort of make sense? That certainly does make sense, um, and I can kind of see that connection. Um, where I see the the biggest difference, and and I think this kind of maps onto that as well. Um, and again, this backs up to kind of mindsets. The, so rather than, again, merely telling teachers, you need to ask more facilitative questions. What drives facilitative questions is curiosity. Right. So the, the teacher, again, they believe that learning occurs um, as a result of our students thinking. So they're wanting to understand the thinking of their students. So they are curious. If you aren't curious about your students thinking, um, that facilitative question is likely to kind of feel like a dud. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to be authentic. Um, students may not respond. You know, there's a, there's a way just to say, what makes you say that that feels confronting right. Right. Um, and challenging and off-putting? And mm -hmm. there's a way to say, what makes you say that that sounds, you know, that I'm connected to you. I'm curious about you. I'm really interested in your ideas yeah. and very, very invitational. And so those facilitative questions are driven by a teacher's curiosity. And so, yeah, um, that idea of, of transformational learning, but also uh, if I know more about my students' thinking, then um, I can be a better teacher. Right. I respond. I can see that they I can see that they really understand this, or I can see there's still confusion or there's a misconception. Um you know, I, you know, years ago, I'm not sure if you're, you're probably familiar with it, that the private universe series that was done by the Harvard Center for Astrophysics, which mm -hmm. dealt a lot 
uh, dealt a lot with misconceptions. So some of the early misconceptions research, and they kind of quite famously um, went to both Harvard and MIT um, graduation ceremonies and asked basic scientific questions and showed that even these graduates of top universities couldn't answer very, very basic questions about the seasons, about mm -hmm the mass of logs and, and and things and it's because you know they were kind of taught the right answer but um misconceptions are very kind of um persisting um well well in in one of their series there there was a a physics teacher that said you know i just i just avoid asking my questions uh, asking my students why because i'm afraid of the answer <laughs> because yeah. All he needed was to get this, you know, oh, they, they know the answer for the test, but if I probe anything, I'm going to reveal that they actually don't understand anything, and I don't want that. <laughs> and so he, he admitted to not asking, you know, his AP students any, you know, um, probing questions that would kind of get underneath um, their responses there because he was too afraid of what he might find out. Hmm. Well, one of the things that I think is is a, a, a part of our, our, I guess, polarization and the ways in which our, our culture and society is really struggling. I have made the hypothesis that it relates to, in, at least in small part, the ways in which our classrooms have looked, my hypothesis is from 1983, A Nation at Risk, and sort of what that created. I was just actually talking with Peter Gray for the podcast and he was making a similar um, hypothesis as well and how that sort of changed the nature of our classrooms and I would say made it a little bit more or incentivized more sort of informational learning and so we've had less of an incentive structure for the kinds of classrooms that you're advocating for that I'm advocating for where you do sort of have this sense of curiosity that sort of you know, bleeds into all of the things that you're doing. And so we have lots of people who just haven't really experienced that in a, in a meaningful way. And so they have a really hard time, one, feeling curious about somebody else's uh, work or, you know, somebody, you know, voted for somebody you don't like. And you say, hmm, instead of saying they're a terrible person, you say, what makes, what, why did you do that? I'm really curious, you know, that sort of interaction with ideas and so it's it really is and i think about the advocacy not only obviously for academic purposes but for a societal set of purposes but to me it, it is it is really really important in ways that would transcend the sort of academic kinds of of outcomes and goals so when you're thinking about the ways in which you help teachers sort of structure and plan for a unit and a lesson, not just a lesson, but a unit, what are some of the steps that you suggest? Like, is there a sort of process um, or I guess set of, uh, of steps that you, you really want them to think about in how they actually structure it? Because it, it, it's not a cookie cutter kind of thing, but we do really want to make sure that we're considering certain things and as as Hattie would say sort of teaching with intent what is our intent and then how do we how do we how do you go through the process of, of figuring out how to actually plan out a unit and so what are your recommendations or how do you how do you work with teachers in that respect um I mean, obviously, one of the, the first things, um, again, connect to my work with teaching of understanding is to think about, well, what is it you really want your students to kind of understand um, within this unit? Um, I might even back up even kind of, um, you know, be, before a unit. And that one of the things that I think that that teachers grapple with and we don't give them enough support on is we get these kind of curriculum documents and some teachers look at that and they, they think that all of this content is the same, meaning that it's all equally valuable, that it's it just means like, here, I've got this content. And so certainly one way that then they deal with that content is chopping it up into units, chopping it up into kind of lessons. Um, but the reality is even those curriculum documents, um, it's not all the same. And so you have to identify, you know, what are those concepts you really um, want to invest more time in? Um, because they're foundational, they're going to really um, provide those anchors 
for some of the smaller bits of learning there. And so if you can look at your curriculum documents and look at your year and identify, ah, uh, you know, here's here's what's really, you know, important. Here's where I need to kind of spend time um, rather than, you know, just beginning to, uh, I've kind of got this already kind of divided up into this unit. That happens at the unit level um, as well too, of recognizing um, again, around those understanding goals, that's where you're going to kind of spend the, those time there mm -hmm. so having identified that kind of first and then you know again looking at those i mean i always think about the issue of student engagement as well too that we want to kind of create those kind of powerful you know learning um, opportunities for students that are going to engage them it's going to make them feel kind of connected to this content when students are, are curious um, when they feel a greater sense of agency and empowerment they're going to learn more so i think about within this content where and how um, can i bring students in can i connect students um, to this content so that it's not just a kind of marching through this um, uh, material where I might lose a lot of students. So I think that's a kind of big, very kind of front end piece, thinking about how we kind of will situate um, the, the content for mm -hmm. students. Um, you know, and then thinking about again some of these ideas of with this content what's the thinking i need to do where um will i present students with the, the challenge and the opportunity to grapple with this kind of big content um identifying those kind of guiding questions so there's a lot of that big kind of front end i think framing before we ever kind of get to the lesson of really you know understanding this connecting it to our students and being really important yeah how do you how do you think about I guess the idea of providing teachers with I guess curriculum materials versus having them be responsible for creating curriculum and materials and things like that? Um, you know, I mean, most. Um, I mean, a lot of times curriculum materials, um, you know, they're designed to kind of hit this wide swath. They're not responsive to the local context of the students, which an individual teacher may be teaching. And so they may not, there may be a big disconnect um, there. They certainly can be useful resources. But again, I'm, I'm all for um, upskilling teachers and um, supporting teachers in that kind of development. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, th that shouldn't be something that is done or feels like it needs to be done individually, but it should be done in collaboration with colleagues and, and developing that, you know, and, and sometimes those are set up in schools. Sometimes school districts do a much better job of supporting um, one another um, across the school district. So there's a greater understanding of their students within that context and, and meeting and kind of reaching mm -hmm. kind of those students. But I think that an off the shelf curriculum, you know, that's generic can just meet all students um, and is going to be responsive to um, our needs. Um, generally isn't the case. I think there are generally going to be a lot of adaptations. And I think that when we give um, teachers the ability to use um, these curriculum materials as a resource rather than as um, a complete roadmap. Right, right. Well, one last question, I think, before um, we jump off. I'm curious what your survey, because if I understand correctly, you get to a lot of schools or, or at least have gotten to a lot of schools and, and are aware of what's going in lots of schools, going on in lots of schools. And what strikes me is, is almost sort of humorous is as I've sort of dived into this quote unquote debate, direct instruction versus, you know, more inquiry and that kind of thing. What seems to be true is that either side thinks what's happening in our schools is hegemonic from the other side, right? The inquiry folks think everything or almost everything is is traditional and lecture and some version of you know the sort of direct and explicit instruction and those folks say you know our schools are rife with progressive discovery learning and some version of that what do you see how would you describe what you see in our schools across the, i guess across america um you know i mean i i 
you know, would be the first event that I see a selective sample of schools because mm -hmm. there are schools that I, I work with that I have long term relationships and kind of develop those. And of course, that's in part going to be because those schools kind of gravitate kind of towards my sure. kind of ideas there. Um, you know, I, I do think that there's that again, sometimes from policymakers who kind of want a quick fix um, that the direct instruction feels like uh, that's a, a way that kind of we can get that. So we're not giving uh, teachers enough time um, to really, again, develop those materials kind of on their own. So, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I've always felt and having worked a lot kind of internationally that um, you know, I often have to explain to international folks that, you know, America is a really very big place and our history is that education is a local enterprise. Mm -hmm. And what that means is there's a huge amount of variability. It's very, very difficult um, to make any, you know, kind of generalizations across um, us. We're really, you know, um, kind of very kind of broken apart there. So um, there's, Certainly, again, as as we've talked about, um, the idea of, of deep learning, that's gotten a lot of um, traction. People are moving kind of forward with that. Um, people are uh, much more kind of recognizing the importance of getting students to think um, and seeing that. And I think even the direct instruction folks who are who are doing it well recognize, yep, mm -hmm. that's really um, important. John Hattie's new work, um, you know, cognitive task analysis is one of the things that gets um, the, the greatest effect size. Mm -hmm. Seeing thinking is, is really kind of important there. So I think that there's a lot of things that um, are gaining traction um, as we understand more about the kind of learning process. So um, in, in some respects, I, I think there's a lot of, of hope that we kind of continue to see kind of those pockets as it is it as widespread as, as I would like. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no, but um, we're certainly kind of making a lot of progress there. But I think that one of the, again, things that I see as a distinction is you can look at the, um, you know, the, the first mindset um, in the book is the idea of um, that if we're going to create cultures of thinking for students, we have to create cultures of thinking for teachers mm -hmm. as well. And so where I see the most progress um, is when schools really look at um, their professional learning, really wanting to create that culture, really teaching, treating teachers as professionals. And I think that that means that uh, as we embark on any set of practices, as we delve into any things, we try to understand them deeply. We try to understand the effects on our students, um, as John Hattie kind of talks about, so that our teaching is much more responsive and much more effective. And so I think that rather than merely thinking, oh, you should do problem-based learning or inquiry or direct instruction, if you begin to really understand those well, you begin to skin see, you know, as I think both you and I do, where we where we see connections across mm -hmm. those, rather than that division. When you don't understand them very well, then it's very easy to just see complete separation. Yeah, uh, that's exactly what I see, and it, it strikes me as odd because when I talk with those folks, I mean, I talked with Paul Kirshner. He he think you know was gracious enough to come on the podcast, and I was saying, Paul, basically, like we're are, we have a Venn diagram here, um, uh, although it's maybe a bit of a marketing message, and and it, it is strange. It's it's very odd to see those camps, and you're like, how do you not see these overlaps? But you know, that's that's for a whole another podcast. You mentioned the cognitive task analysis, and that's something that you that you talk about and, and work through in the book as well. So if we had more time, we'd talk about that. But just wanted to mention that because it is, I think, a, a really interesting piece to to the whole puzzle. And folks, you know, if, if you're interested in any of that and any of this, definitely should get the book. Uh, so the book is Cultures of Thinking in Action. 10 Mindsets to Transform Our Teaching and Students' Learning. Ron, anything else that uh, that you wanted to say and uh, talk about and or obviously any links that you want to give out so folks can find you and your work and all of that good stuff? 
Um, well, um, so great talking with you, Drew. Um, always a delightful kind of conversation as we get in kind of the, the meat of education. There are some resources for people. So on um, social media, and it's at, at Ron Richart. Um, we do have a website, which is cultures-of-thinking.org. Um, and if people are just wanting a kind of quick introduction to the mindsets, they can find that um, at that kind of website um, there. Um, the book then really kind of takes people in in depth, giving them um, a way of really thinking about how to move forward with this in your um, classrooms and at your schools. Yeah, and we'll make sure to put those in the in the show notes. So folks want to click through there and, and click on that certainly do. Same here. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, to take a look at your work and to have a conversation about it. I appreciate the time and the conversation. Great. Thanks, Drew. What we need to do is spend enough time together that we can start to translate our ideas into each other's language and include one another in this community of inquiry. And that is the work of love.